Hello, this is Clarence Moy with the Words Daily here with production designer Guy Hendricks Dias from Pablo Lorraine's critically acclaimed film, Spencer. Guy, it's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, real pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me. So what I want to do is I want to go through some of the, the, the more critical scenes of the film and, and talk about some of the, the sets and, and obviously all the things that you've done to work to create this piece of art. But I'd love to start with the Sandringham estate, the quote unquote Sandringham estate, because obviously right. you could not film there on, you know, in the actual Sandringham. So you had to find a reasonable facsimile. So talk to me about finding that location. You know, I, I have to start at the very beginning. Pablo always uh, viewed Sandringham in, in, in the Stephen Knight script as sort of a, I, I suppose, a, a fairy tale palace mm -hmm. uh, from, you know, the dark side. He never really saw it as being a classic facsimile of Sandringham, as we've seen in some of the beautiful, extraordinary uh, designs of other films and, and TV shows. He really wanted it to stand on its own and perhaps reflect more, um, you know, the emotions that our characters were feeling rather than uh, be an absolute bricks and mortar perfect copy. Sure. So, you know, to be honest with you, this was also problematic because we chose to shoot in Germany. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, although you could argue Argue that there are some similarities in the architecture at its core base. Uh, you know, British architecture of this period and German architecture of this period are two very, very different animals. I mean, just to put it bluntly, the British tend to sculpt lions and unicorns, and the Germans tend to sculpt dragons and eagles for the uh, gargoyles and things that are around their castles and palaces. So there's sort of an inherent difference in the style. Um, and I had to really work around that. It was pretty hard to find these places. We ended up honestly creating um, a cocktail of locations uh, and sets to, to build our Sandringham. Interesting. And uh, of course you had to find something with a moat around it, right? To make it look even more foreboding. <laughs> that, that didn't happen at the very, very beginning. At the very beginning, we were really scouting uh, from the north to the south of Germany, looking for things that would look British. And mm -hmm. uh, Pablo and I spent many, many hours traveling around, listening um, to music and, and just talking about the film. It's very much his very wonderful poetic style. And we coined this expression, the elegant prison. Um, and uh, this sort of sparked an idea in our heads that we really shouldn't be searching for this perfect match. We should just embrace our surroundings and look for something that would match Stephen Knight's written word. And so we threw out there the idea that if there was anywhere with a moat, we'd be happy to see it because to us, a moat represented that sort of that prisoner, you know, um, uh, sort of feeling. And uh, of course, one of the places we use, which is featured very heavily in the film with that amazing uh, uh, top shot uh, by Pablo and Claire, uh, is Norkirchen Castle, which of course is sort of uh, actually a university, if you can believe it. Oh, wow. Um, but uh, was transformed into our uh, very austere exterior for uh, Sandringham with the use of a lot of bright green sod grass and uh, lots of um, topiary and uh, literally 12 tons of pea stones, which I use to dress the driveway mm -hmm. and, uh, e and entrance to the house to make it mm -hmm. feel more like a an aristocratic stately home rather than a sort of a university with a concrete road. <laughs> right. So you, you you talked about the beginning where you've got that fantastic shot. And, and during that, that beginning sequence, you've got the armed forces, the, the military bringing their, their machines, their, um, their vehicles in, and then they've got the big boxes that you don't know what's in. And then all of a sudden that ends up becoming the accoutrement for the, uh, the Christmas weekend food. Um, so is there truth grounded in that, or is that something that, that was designed for this film? Did, you know, how did you figure out what that whole sequence would look like in terms of what they, they bring in and, and all of those uh, items? Well, you know, when we first, when I first got 
uh, Stephen Knight's uh, script and read through it, a lot of the facts in there rang true to me. And obviously mm -hmm. my, my heritage, heritage is that I'm British. So uh, it's sort of in my blood and growing up uh, with the Royals on television all the time and learning about them at school, there are certain facts that you know to be true. There are other things, of course, in the script, which are there, uh, I think, as sort of a tongue in cheek play on the order and military precision uh, that the family run their, their lives by. And of course, if you're telling the story of this uh, free spirited young woman who's really now deep into a marriage and a family that, that she doesn't fit into, um, any time that you can show, I suppose, a little bit of the eccentricity and absurdity of the daily procedure surrounding the royal family, it's going to enhance the audience's ability to relate to her. So in truth, there is um, a security detail that is heightened around Sandringham during the lead up to their Christmas holiday. Uh, there are specific people who make deliveries uh, that are uh, under huge secrecy with big convoys of security to the royal house. Uh, but whether the food is delivered in military boxes or not, um, I'll leave that to you in the audience to decide. I love the um, the sort of the fun of that and uh, the the sort of shorthand of of telling the story in that way, because it really sets the tone for everything else you're going to see in the film. Yes. Um, to be honest with you, one of the hardest things was keeping all that food so beautifully arranged with the dry ice while oh. these guys were carrying these boxes. As a production designer, I've never been more involved in food as I have on this production. It was its own a uh, minuscule architectural feat to keep all this stuff together. Well, that was actually my next question. What is your relationship to the food in the film? I mean, obviously you know, food is a very important thing in the film because obviously it it, it has to, to fit the, the requirements of this royal family, but also it has to repulse Diana in this, in this case because of her, obviously, you know, her bulimia issues. So talk to me about picking out the food and the arrangements for all of that? Well, huge amounts of research went into the food and um, the uh, table layouts and the seating arrangements. The family all sit in a very specific order. All of these things were massively time consuming to absorb and understand. And really, um, for me personally, as the production designer, knowing I had a limited amount of time to tell these stories within the, the larger story that Pablo and Stephen Knight wanted to tell, I had to, in a way, I suppose, you know, distill all this research that I was absorbing and sort of retell it in its visual essence. Um, and so picking out specific dishes and things like this, um, a lot of these are researched and correct, but there was a lot of art direction involved in this as well. I think anyone watching this who has uh, perhaps been involved in a commercial or a feature film or a television series that has had a lot of food will relate to what I'm about to say which is it is an absolute, um, ups, absolutely huge undertaking to organize food to not only look good and be delivered on camera to the DPs and the director's liking, but it's another thing to make sure that your performer can actually eat the food and it arrives hot or right. the right temperature for them to be able to consume it if that's the case. I mean, looking a little deeper into one of the scenes, of course, the, the, one of the scenes that will be talked about, I think, a lot is uh, Diana um, and the soup scene and the necklace. Yes. Of course, this soup was soup number 14 uh, of a whole array of scientific experiments we went through to design a soup that was the correct color and more importantly, the correct viscosity so that the soup, as it plopped down into the bowl, had the right feeling to, I think, provoke feelings of, um, quite frankly, 
grossness as well right. as deliciousness. It's an extremely hard emotion to, <laughs> to get out of somebody, which is how do you make somebody feel that food is both delicious and grotesque at the same time. The necklace, by the way, was an absolute work of art. Um, we had uh, hired two food stylists actually in Germany to organize and deliver all these huge demands that Pablo and I made upon them. And uh, what the, the necklace in itself was made up of these extraordinary uh, threaded chocolate balls that were so, glazed um, in uh, this uh, candy shell that was pearlescent and to my eye anyway looks absolutely spot on and a complete match for these extraordinary pearls which we had for the film um, and enabled Kristen to chomp down on them as you see in the film it was right. remarkable you know that's 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 fascinating because I was not going to actually actually ask you about how that that necklace was created and how is it you know so vividly rendered that she's chomping down as you say on that on the pearl um, so it was a chocolate necklace it was a chocolate necklace and of course everything in that scene uh from you know the little quartet and Johnny Greenwood's music sort of just descending into this freeform surrealistic jazz you know, even using, for example, a deep red uh, tablecloth is completely not appropriate for the royal family. They would have absolutely had a white tablecloth, but I needed to provide a color that was going to not create light bounce for Claire's very painterly lighting for this scene. Um, we did a lot of um, pre-production experimentation, Claire and I, in terms of candlelight and what we could do with her film stock and, and uh, the amount of glow she wanted on the faces. We wanted particularly the queen with that scowl that she has and Prince Charles and, and Diana's faces to be, to glow slightly more than the other royals around them. So you almost had this uh, focal uh, attention that was created with the use of light, but candlelight rather than, um, you know, any, any other particular effect. Of course, the other thing for me personally was trying to keep all those candles perfectly the right height and in continuity because they burn down so quickly because of the heat of that scene. Right. Also in that sequence, you know, you open, Pablo opens on the, uh, the quartet playing and yes. then Diana walks into the room and then the servers come in with the bowls and they're kind of surrounding her. One thing that I noticed on my second watch was the color of the soup matches the color of her dress, or it's, it's very, very similar, which also matches the drapes behind her when she sits down. Are all of these things deliberate? Absolutely. And I'm so thrilled anytime anyone can notice this. For me, when I was reading the script, I, I really needed to, I suppose, uh, jump on that, that fine balance of how do we create the most elegant and ornate and delicious meal? Everybody's fantasy of what a royal meal would be. And at the same time, have a sort of an underlying feeling of sickness and, and uh, disgust. And for me, that green color evokes that feeling in a strange way, especially when you add that yellow candlelight to it. Because what happens is the silk wallpaper that I use, which actually is fabric, it's not wallpaper, it, it reflects uh, that light from the candles. So you have this strange golden glow mixed with one of the most really unpleasant greens I could come up with. It's sort of a um, a, I suppose, a milky lime yeah. green. It's really quite disgusting. Um, and getting everyone on board with that was extraordinary, from the costume designer to, uh, you know, our decorating team. Um, it, it was something else. I mean, I, I had no doubt Kristen would look gorgeous because she just looks gorgeous throughout the film. But at the same time, that green dress, the soup, the curtains, the wallpaper, the music, everything is there to, to create this feeling of uh, discomfort, you know? Sure. So another thing that happens over this weekend, it is Christmas weekend, right? So you, she misses 
in the first uh, third of the film, she misses the the opening of the presents on Christmas Eve, but she goes into yeah. the Christmas Eve room to pick up the pearl necklace, of course. Um, you had to obviously decorate for Christmas. When you did that, is is did you use your imagination in terms of how big can this get, or were you you know were you looking at photographs, art, something like that that exists that talks about what their Christmas traditions are? No, uh, of course that there's a there's a point e with the royal family even in this modern day where they are definitely more accessible than they they used to be. Even in the '90s, they were less accessible, quite honestly. And um, uh, Diana is a, a phenomenon. She is the person who I think forced the royal family to open up and sort of say, "Hey, look, we're we're human, just like you." Um, but for that period of time and for that sort of post Christmas celebration, I literally just had to use my own uh, dressing instincts. I mean, I this film was so intimate, and the way Pablo and I tend to work is he he likes me there. And so while I'm busy sketching and painting digitally, you know, behind the scenes, I'm also there working with, with the uh, set dressers, making sure that everything's just perfect and to our liking. So yeah, it was me who was personally ripping open presents, which we had pre-wrapped and spread them around and trying to sort of channel my inner child, you know, those two boisterous kids, you know, how would they be? What would they be opening? What were the toys and the gadgets that would have been in vogue in 1991? All of these things needed to be taken into consideration. But it's one scene where, where I also felt that certainly for Pablo and I, we allowed ourselves just to spew out that perfect sort of Norman Rockwell Christmas. You know, we wanted to show uh, wow, look at that. Look at the size of that Christmas tree. Look at that gorgeous tapestry and the way the colors work with the wallpaper and the upholstery. I, I, I mean, it's always hard as a production designer because you go into levels of detail that not many people will, will notice. But if you look at that scene again, you should actually be able to even pick out where the individuals were sitting based on what's around them, what paper right. is ripped, the way the paper is opened, you'll notice that certain areas, uh, the paper is neatly folded uh, as it would be with the Queen Mother and perhaps Charles. And uh, you can see where the boys were because everything's ripped like crazy. But yes, we really went to town. Reflection was also a very, very big thing for Pablo and Claire, working the science of making sure that there was lots of reflected light and reflected surfaces without seeing the camera during some of those moves was quite challenging to say the least. So I wanna leave Sandringham for a second and go to the Spencer family estate, which is in the film boarded up. She has to borrow a torch. She gets wire cutter, right. bolt cutters to make her way through it, to break into her family home and to relive you know, memories of her childhood. Um, talk to me about is that a real estate? Is that a sound stage? You know, how did you design all of that? You know, it's it's uh, to me, it's always really lovely when when I hear that people can't tell what anything yeah, yeah. is, uh, yeah. uh, because it proves that we kind of pulled it off. And and if I tell you that, you know, both the Sandringham estate and also Diana's, you know, childhood home where, where she was born, um, this is all mixed up in one big cocktail of locations and sets and 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 really the strangest places and, and we'll get into that i'm sure later in this conversation but but primarily the her childhood home uh, park house was a a rundown house that we located uh in potsdam which is sort of i think to the west of of uh, of berlin mm -hmm. and uh we went in there and transformed it really into what you see. Um, you know, it was empty. But as I've learned over the years, you know, you can portray an empty house or you can really portray an empty house by putting a few pieces of furniture in it. <laughs> Somehow a house looks more empty when it has a single chair 
or um, you know, a stripped bed or something like that. You, you're more aware of the emptiness than you are when a room's actually empty. And uh, we, we tried to, to show that with, with, this, uh, with this location. There were a lot of things we had to do. For example, the staircase was constructed so that Kristen could walk up a stair staircase made of balsa wood and rubber that could collapse without obviously hurting her. She was a great sport with that. Um, and um, yeah, we knew that everything was going to be almost in the dark, except for her bedroom, which was going to have this almost very um, angelic moonlight pouring in the windows in order just to sort of show enough of her past life, you know, this sort of idyllic childhood that led her to this, you know, cage that she's living in now. And she sort of breaks down. It was really lovely to do. Yeah, and it feels incredibly haunted, right? I mean, it, it's not, it, it's, it's, I, I love the idea that you had the one chair or the stripped bed because it does feel like a, um, a haunted house essentially and 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 I have heard the film described as a as a ghost story about living people <laughs> that's a very good description I might steal that one you know it's funny <laughs> uh, when when Pablo and I talked about as we always do I mean we're both huge film fans and 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 uh, just consume film and and books on 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 film as, as you can see and uh, one of the films that we immediately started thinking about of course was citizen kane mm. and uh of course xanadu which is essentially a its own character in orson welles masterpiece and again if you look at xanadu it, it is a space that's made up of the deepest blacks and shadows where there really isn't anything and then these extraordinary expanses of space with again very sparse furniture and clever lighting and I think Pablo, Claire, and myself all really on board the idea of within reason creating, uh, you know, this same philosophy of, of open spaces. And I think this led to the montage that you see with uh, uh, Diana really frantic running around some of those empty spaces when she's interacting with, with uh, some of the other ghostly characters, I don't want to say, in the film. You know that uh, scene is is completely uh, inspired by you know Orson Welles and, and Xanadu. That's fantastic. So my last question for you is perhaps a a, a very small question, but I, I'm trying to crack the the riddle of the pool balls. That scene where Diana and Charles are on the opposite ends of the pool table. You've got a pyramid, a, a, a proper formation of pool balls. They're all red. What's going on with the color? What's going on with the positioning? They're positioned very, is that, a, is that not a pool table? Is that something British that I'm just not aware of or? It, it is, it, it is, but you're absolutely forgiven for being completely confused because we have a game in England that's called snooker. Okay. And um, you play it on a much larger table. That table you're looking at is actually 12 feet by six as opposed wow. to the smaller pool tables that, you know, we love to have a beer and shoot knock balls around on. It's a much bigger table. It's a much more complex. And it's a game taken very, very seriously in my country, like cricket and all those other nutty eccentric games <laughs> that we play. And that table is always, always, always green. It is never red. Okay. But in creating that scene, which Pablo really, really tortured himself over in terms of the tone of how Diana would approach Charles, how Charles would be. Because again, we weren't painting Charles as a villain. He's his own incredibly interesting and articulate and likable character who has his own tortured story to tell. And we had these two characters and we wanted to create a very strong visual barrier between them, a wall between them that would stand out. And I presented the idea of a pool table to Pablo, or, or sorry, a snooker table to Pablo, which he loved and knew the game. But then he came back to me with a twinkle in his eye and said, how do you feel about being a little, uh, you know, a little dangerous with the color of that table? I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I know it's a complete faux pas to have that table as anything other than green 
but let's explore different colors. So we went through all the possible colors that we could create that table in, landing on that very deep maroon that you see there in, in the room, which is quite eye-catching and uh, very distracting. I will tell you that for British people, it's a cardinal sin to uh, dress a, a, a snooker table in anything other than green. So I, I'm, I'm getting ready for the hate mail on that one. Um, but the balls that you see in the arrangement of the balls is the arrangement of a snooker game at the very beginning of that game. Okay, okay. You know, when on my second view, at first, the first time I saw it, I assumed it was a pool table. The second time I saw it, it was, um, you, I noticed that there were almost like soccer goal lines on the table or something, you know, and, and the balls are positioned carefully on the table. So I, I was very confused. I was wondering, you know, was what was this game had I ne that I'd never heard of, never seen before. So uh, that's really fascinating. Well, Pablo and I desperately wanted to honestly uh, while away our evenings, we shot that scene in the hotel. We wanted to have our evenings drinking wine and, and playing snooker, but we didn't because we were so frightened of scratching the, the darn table before we shot it. So we never actually played a game on that thing, but we did want to. Um, it's funny because you talk about sports and soccer. It wasn't the only sports reference in the film. Our kitchen, which you can imagine was a hugely important set in the film to create uh, so much of that food, was actually a concessions kitchen at a modern soccer stadium in the middle of Berlin, if you can believe it. And wow. we completely transformed that kitchen into a um, what I believe to be a fairly accurate representation of the kitchen at Sandringham. You know, these kitchens uh, in these old palaces and stately homes were built in some cases around the 17th century and had, you, you know, very old fashioned uh, cookers and stoves and things like that. And everything's been modernized into stainless steel, but you still have the shell which of course would have been built on those, uh, those foundations. And um, so for us, we loved this kitchen basically because Pablo wanted all the kitchen scenes to, to feel like a military dance almost in the way that the food was prepared. I think you get that sense from the, from the film, but at the same, and this uh, kitchen offered us those opportunities because it was so big. But the walls were very modern, you know, it was all completely state of the art architecture. So we literally had to skin that kitchen in old uh, brick plaster and arches so that we could then place and dress all those copper pans and things that you see. So I have to assume then if, if most of the interior scenes are filmed in different locations, where was the the main hall sequence filmed where she walks in and she must be weighed so that she can prove that she's enjoyed uh, her Christmas weekend by gaining three pounds. Three stones. That, that was another location actually uh, called Kronberg, which is a hotel uh, in, the, in the, I think it's in the south of Germany. I want to say it's near Frankfurt and it's actually a, a very elite hotel uh, with a, a golfing ground next to it. And mm. that wonderful floor that you see there uh, was completely hidden with an atrocious hotel carpet. I, I really shouldn't be rude, but um, the hotel, as you can imagine, was decorated as a lot of hotels are with, with sort of not much attention to, uh, <laughs> certainly not trying to look like a, a, a British royal uh, residence. Course, and course. in scouting, one of the things I started getting into the habit of was lifting up these carpets in the corner to see what the original floor was. And I discovered this absolutely gorgeous uh, black and white floor, which looked like a chessboard uh, on first appearance. And for me, what I love about it, it's become one of the sort of iconic things that you remember about our, uh, you know, fantasy Sandringham is that wonderful floor but it was completely covered nobody knew it was there not even the hotel manager knew, <laughs> knew wow. that it was under there so the the irony of course is by the time we left they decided to leave it uncovered they loved it so much well it looks fantastic I mean it's beautiful it's gorgeous mm, I um, agree <laughs> Well, Guy, thank you so much for the time this was a fantastic conversation very eye-opening and I really enjoyed it thank you so much for your time Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.